let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. So friends, it's a, a pleasure to welcome you back to our second midweek Lenten reflection on the seven wonders of the word. Now, just as a reminder, that's the title of a book of daily Lenten devotions by Catherine Kleinhans that's available through Augsburg Fortress, if you're interested. And what we're doing for our online Lenten services this year is we're just taking a few minutes to reflect on a theme that rises from her devotions for the week. On Ash Wednesday, our message focused on the manner in which God's Word creates. Then last week, we looked at how God's Word calls us. And now this week, our focus is on the manner in which God's Word commands us. Now, this will be a trickier topic this week because the central text for this week is the Ten Commandments. And in several of Klein Hans's devotions, focus on individual commands among them. Uh, but I don't want this message to be all fractured and fragmented as we maybe jump from one commandment to the next. So instead, I want to focus this evening on the nature of God's commands to us in the written scripture as well as through Christ Jesus. First off, I think Klein Hans rightly points out that the word that is often used for commandments is actually a word that means word. In, in fact, we, we often call the Ten Commandments that we find in the 20th chapter of Exodus and the 5th chapter of Deuteronomy, we call them the Decalogue, which means the Ten Words. And it doesn't just mean words like a, a specific element of written or spoken language, like a vocabulary word. In this case, in, in Greek, it's the logos, the utterances or reasoning or ideas or thoughts, designs, perhaps even just the underlying principles of God. What Moses brought down that hill from God wasn't so much the ten rules of God carved in stone forever and ever, amen. It's these divine thoughts, these ideas and truths that God offered to humanity in order to establish harmony among God, God's people, and all of God's creation. And, and even more than that, the ten words form the beginning of this great conversation that God initiated with these people that God had already bestowed so much love and care on. That's what comes first among these words, this idea that God hasn't just released the Hebrews from slavery to the Egyptians and replaced the rule of their Egyptian taskmasters with this new decree of duty that they must perform for their new taskmaster, who would be God. No, these words are predicated by the reminder that they are being offered these amazing ideas as a part of their ongoing relationship with God that's been unfolding before them for generations as, as has been traced through the story of God's creation, God's provision for them that have sustained them through the course of history, God's many attempts to reconcile humanity to God and one another, and God's mighty works in releasing them from Pharaoh. And because of this context, they enter into this conversation with God, not as slaves, but as beloved creatures who have learned that they can rely on God's goodness and God's compassion. And because of that, we can see in these words something more kindly and wise and life-giving than just a set of random impossible commandments that God has set for us. And I want to focus on this idea of the Ten Commandments as being a, a part of an ongoing conversation that we're having with God, rather than the last word of God on the subject that's been thrown down for us before God you know, stormed off, leaving us to obey or die the death decreed to those who fail to rise to the challenge. So, just as an example, 
In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 5, we read, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. That's right there among the commandments. And that may seem like, well, you know, the Bible says it, so that's the final word on the subject. But a little later, we find that both the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel hear God refuting that claim that the children will be punished for the sins of their parents. And you can read about that in Jeremiah's voice uh, in uh, the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, where he talks about how he hears God saying that the people shall no longer say that the parents have eaten sour grapes and set the teeth of their children on edge, but he says, all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. And in the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, we hear a very similar kind of a, a logic. In verse 20, Ezekiel tells us that he has heard God tell him to proclaim that the person whose sins shall die, a child shall not suffer for the iniquity of a parent, nor a parent suffer for the iniquity of a child. The righteousness of the righteous shall be his own, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be his own. And I'm bringing this up today in the context of the way God's word commands us in order to point out that this truly is an ongoing conversation rather than the last word of God on the matter. God's word invites us to enter into the conversation, to, to wrestle with God as Jacob wrestled with God, to hear of how the commandments of God brought life to these people in these certain places and times and cultures, and to hear how their culture continued the conversation with God and sometimes heard God nuance or refine or even release some bits of the word over time. And we see this most clearly in the person of Jesus, who John tells us is the word of God incarnated among us. On several occasions, we hear of how he himself chose not to follow the letter of the law in the ways that the religious establishment would have expected, particularly breaking laws and traditions that were associated with the Sabbath in order to perhaps nuance them for the people of his time. And as he concludes in the second chapter of Mark, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So here he points out that he, as the living word of God, has precedence over the written word as traditionally interpreted. And in the first two verses of Hebrews, we hear, Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. So for those of us who follow the word, who lived and died and lives again for us, his life, his teachings, his actions, his responses to various people and situations, and his grace in dying for us and, and forgiving us all from the cross are all aspects of the word that he is and the word that he offers and the word that captures our hearts and commands us today. And he summarized the law for us when he said that we are to love the Lord our God with all our hearts and souls, strength and minds, and, and love our neighbors as ourselves. And then he gave us that one new commandment. In John 13, 34, he says that you should love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. And, and just by the way, he used a word in that instance for uh, that that actually means a commandment, a, a writ, an order, or a precept, rather than just a, a word that means word. But even so, 
Our conversation continues as we dive in deep to see how the law of love that our Lord gave us shines through the life that he lived for us and how we might live out that commandment to love one another that Jesus, the word of God, gives us. And please, friends, don't think that anything I've said here is meant to disparage the law of our our Lord or our call to be obedient to God. My only hope is that as we better understand the nature of how God's word commands us, we can follow that call more fully and more purely. Let's close with a word of prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for your word that speaks to us as it has spoken to so many generations before us. May we hear you clearly and follow you with open and obedient hearts. Even so, may we be as bold to enter into the conversation on how you call us to live out your will in our times as the prophets of old were in theirs. And may we embrace the word of God revealed to us in Christ Jesus as he draws us into your ways, your desires, and your commandments for us, that we might live out the law of love for the sake of our God and our neighbors and your creation, now and forever. Amen. So friends, uh, once again, I want to thank you for joining me for this session, and I pray that your, your life is blessed as you walk this uh, Lenten journey with us, following God in all his calls to us for obedience and love for one another. Amen.
the joy and the love of the Lord, we are called to be light for the kingdom, to live in the freedom of the city of God. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another, to walk humbly with God. Come, open your heart. Show your mercy to all those in fear. We are called to be hope for the hopeless, so hatred and blindness will be no more. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another, to walk humbly with 